Hi guys, it's Mary McIntyre. Welcome back to my channel. It's been a while since I've done a kind of face-to-face -face video with you guys on this channel. Been very busy over on my craft channel. Um, today's video is all about stacking Milky Way photographs using Sequator. Sequator is a free piece of software for stacking. You can do star trails with it as well. But every time I share Milky Way photos, which I've been doing a little bit of again now that we're kind of in Milky Way season, uh, everybody asks me how you go about doing it. There are some really useful features in Sequator, such as freezing the foreground so that it doesn't blur, particularly important because the kind of bit of the Milky Way that we don't get to see very often from the UK is very low down in the southern sky and it's moving really quickly so if you take lots of exposures and stack them your foreground gets blurred so conventionally you would take some separate exposures for the foreground and have to blend them in photoshop but sequator does it for you which is amazing and it does a really good job it's also got the ability to reduce light pollution and i tested this feature a couple of weeks ago um, the photographs that I'm using in today's demonstration are not the best for a couple of reasons. First of all, I took them when we don't actually get astronomical darkness because they were taken near midsummer's night um, here in the UK. So there's quite a lot of haze in them as well. So not only was it not fully dark, there was also a lot of low level haze, which meant that a lot of local light pollution was really showing up in the images. So I thought I'd give it a go and I tried it at a few different kind of intensity levels levels and when I looked at the raw stack I was like oh the maximum level's a bit much but actually when I processed them all side by side that was the best one so it actually did a really good job of that. Now Sequator is pretty easy to use once you kind of figure out a couple of little tricks and little kind of things that you need to check in the menus. So I want to take you through that. So the images that I'm using today were taken with my very very old trusty Canon 1100D and I was using my standard one, not my astronomy modded camera, and I was using my Canon 10 to 18 mil lens. That lens only goes down to f4.5, and when I was saving up to buy that lens, I thought, yeah, that'll be good enough. That one f-stop difference from the kit lens going down to 3.5 compared to that makes a massive difference. So this is the one occasion where I have to use ISO 3200 with a budget camera that's as old as mine that always introduces noise but if I don't introduce the noise there's no Milky Way in the pictures because they're just that bit too dark so it's just a trade-off you just have to do what works for your equipment and I don't have a super high-end camera and super high-end lenses so I just make it work for me so the, the images are not perfect by any stretch of the imagination but if you've taken better ones than me you'll still be able to follow this tutorial and I'll show you exactly how Sequator works um, when I start my screen share, I will begin with the images already open in Sequator. So all you do is drag and drop your images and it will work with RAW files so you don't have to convert them to TIFFs first. Um, always shoot with RAW if you're going to be stacking. Absolutely, JPEG is so lossy that you lose most of your data. So always shoot in RAW. Um, when you drag and drop them, Sequator does not use the same naming convention that pretty much every other software in the history of astrophotography uses. So when you drag and drop them, they're not called light frames like they are in other software they're called star frames then I've also shot some dark frames because of the age of my camera having some darks really helps to smooth out the background when you drag and drop your darks which you also have to shoot in raw um, they are called noise images so it's star images and noise images are the two um, image types when you drag and drop them that you need to select uh, I've already got them in there because when I do a screen share I'm not sure if it will actually show the process of dragging and dropping but I'm sure you guys are big enough to figure out how to drag and drop some images the important thing is what comes next so I will switch to zoom now and I'll record my screen share and talk you through how I do stacking in Sequator don't forget to hit like if you found this useful and don't you please feel free to share it with anybody that you think might find it helpful Okay, so I dragged and dropped my raw files. So you can see that your star images are listed on the left side here. It will automatically select an image as the base image. Usually I let it 
default but if there is like a very windy night and there's one picture where your trees are maybe a bit more stationary in your single exposure then choose that one but for the purposes of this demo i'm just going to leave it as is so you can double click that and choose the image that you want to be the base image which is what will have the foreground frozen if you use that option it's also got the noise files in here um, if you want to include flat images, you can do. I have never needed to do that for Milky Way photography, but they are called vignetting images in this software. So just be aware of that. So we are stacking. So we want to align on the stars and have accumulation so that it will add all those images together. And even though these were taken with a static tripod, they are 25 second exposures, ISO 3200, as I said before, F4.5. So we want to stack all of those together. So that's accumulation. But down here, if you want to freeze your foreground, there's not a lot of foreground in this image, but if you've got images with more of a foreground in them, check this freeze ground box and that will make sure that you keep that bit frozen when we tell it what to freeze in a second so that is the one button that people often miss and if you don't check that it will not freeze your foreground so over here we then go down to sky region at the moment it says full area but if you move your mouse over the sky you can see if you use your mouse track wheel you can change the size of this circle you basically want to paint out the whole sky that you want to stack so you just go along with the mouse and just kind of check all of this hang on i need to move that box out of the way otherwise it won't let me paint it out so yeah paint the sky but not the foreground leave your foreground and leave a little bit of a boundary so if you need to kind of shrink that down a little bit just go around anything that is in your foreground it's best to leave a little bit of a gap don't go right up to the trees otherwise your foreground can end up with a bit of a halo but this region here is where all that exciting bit of the the galactic core is that's the bit that we really want to image from the uk when we can so you can paint that out, you can have it irregular, you can do it as a straight line. It really just depends on what's in your image. Um, further down here, we've got the reduced light pollution. You can see in the raw image, there's a lot of pink there. There was so much haze. So you can double click on the, the light pollution to turn it on. Um, we've got uneven here. Uh, so you can choose uneven or deep sky. So I've gone for uneven. It has this intelligently aggressive mode, which is what I found last time actually worked quite well. So it analyzes your image and then will apply what it thinks is the correct amount. If you don't want it to do that, there is a slider here where you can, if you uncheck that box, you can make it very strong or very weak. And I kind of went through and did a few tests on this and the intelligent one actually did a pretty good job. This is a very good piece of software. I really like it. You can also do binning. Um, it's called merging pixels on this. Um, so that's called merge for pixels if you need to bin the images for any reason. It's also got the dynamic noise reduction and high dynamic range. For the most part, I ignore nearly all of these settings. It's just this kind of light pollution one is quite useful when you know that you've got light pollution in your image. So that's kind of it. But the other little trick is that you have to name your file before you actually create the stack. So I'm just going to save this image in my videos. And this is an 11 image stack. So we're going to call it Milky Way 11 image stack and it will be an uncompressed TIFF file. So it's kind of weird. You have to name it and save it before it's done the actual stacking. So that's kind of it. So the crucial things really are to freeze the ground, make sure you've painted out all of the sky, checked this box here saying freeze ground, and it's going to align on the stars, which is what you want. Um, so that's kind of it, really. You've got your file saved up here. So just click start. 
And it does this so quickly. It's amazing how fast it is. Like for years, I used Deep Sky Stacker for Milky Way photography, which to be fair to Deep Sky Stacker is not what it's in designed for. The clue is in the name. It's for deep sky telescopic images. And it does an okay job, but it doesn't have these kind of built in functions that Sequator has. And I just find for Milky Way stacking, this does a better job. So what it's done there is loaded up the images, it's preparing a master dark so that it will subtract the noise from all of the images, and it's then doing all the analysis, loading everything, and will just basically make the stack. Okay, so that's now stacked. So here is the raw unstacked image and you can see that it looks really dark because it's applied a pretty aggressive amount of light pollution removal. But when I went on and processed a bunch of these, this gave me the best result. So processing the image, doing some basic levels and curves adjustments, plus a little bit of adjustment brush in Lightroom, you can see that it's really brought out the Milky Way. Um, so you can experiment with the light pollution settings and find the one that works best for your conditions. I generally wouldn't apply this aggressive an amount of light pollution removal but the haze that night was really bad. So you can see although there's not a lot of foreground here it is frozen. So just to give you an example of what it would look like if you didn't freeze the foreground here is another image that I took in Dorset. This is a 20 image stack and you can see that the foreground is really blurry and it was in focus in the original images it's just that in the stacking process the foreground has ended up becoming blurred because the Milky Way is moving and it's moving pretty fast when you're looking at that part of the sky. So by freezing the foreground and doing a little bit of light pollution removal this is the result that I got from that. So um, I love the reflection of Jupiter on the sea. You can just see that, um, which is really cool. So this freeze foreground function is so good and it does it in one click, which is so much easier than having to do it in Photoshop. And whenever I do that in Photoshop, I always struggle to get them to blend smoothly. Now you can apply this stacking thing if you do like a mega overlapping panorama of the Milky Way. So this photograph is the most detailed Milky Way photo that we've ever done and we did this together in Dorset again and what we did here is created 12 overlapping panes using an Astro modded Canon 1100D but with the fixed 50mm lens so we had it on the Star Adventure in Mini so each pane was 20 second exposures and we stacked seven lots of 20 seconds so what we did is shot each of those panes um, seven images per pane, stacked them all in sequator. Once stacked, I then stitched them all together using Microsoft Ice and then did the processing. So that's the order that I would recommend doing it because if you try to process the images before stitching them, you're going to introduce artifacts and the software will struggle to line things up properly. And the chances of you doing the right amount of everything to keep them consistent throughout the panorama, I certainly wouldn't be able to to do that so um stack stitch process that's kind of the general order that i would do that in so there you go that was my simple tutorial on how i use sequator for stacking the milky way i hope you found that useful if you did please don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you like astronomy content and feel free to share this video with anybody that might find it useful take care everybody stay safe i'll see you in the next one bye for now